First at Five. From the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, you're watching WUFT News. Welcome to WUFT News First at Five. I'm Allison Williams. And I'm Camila Pereira. Thanks for joining us. We start off today with the latest on the single-family zoning dilemma in Gainesville. The City Plan Board met on Monday evening for further discussions alongside Gainesville citizens. Troy Myers was on the scene to witness the meeting, the meeting unfolding. The City Planning Board met to hear and take action on recommendations for rescinding the single-family land use ordinance. After three hours, the board motioned to continue the item and meet again in a couple of months. It's a yes or no on something that affects the entirety of the city without an alternative. And that seems to me, frankly, pretty reckless. Three items on the agenda. Street issues, tree issues, and housing issues. Some of which were how to better use the tree management fund and the hot topic of single family versus multifamily housing. The housing issue was not voted on, yet it drew the most public comment. The exclusionary and inclusionary zoning debate dominated the last year's city commission, capturing media and public attention. However, board members were reluctant to vote after hearing the staffer's recommendation. Fifteen attendees also participated in public comment. In fact, those against exclusionary zoning, like UF student Vishnu Malotra, argued that it contributes to segregation. Get rid of exclusionary zoning that was started out of like racist intentions to separate communities and keep them expensive and pursuing a situation where people can choose where they want to live, right? We live in a country where like we have a choice to do everything else, to like choose our own jobs, to choose how we want to live and where we want to live. A resident, Peggy Carr, worries about how much of the city would be affected with inclusionary zoning. We are concerned that this proposal would rezone such a large part of the city from existing single-family zoning um, to uh, allow multifamily housing in those zoning districts. City Planning Board member Stephanie Sutton brought up the point that 63 percent of Gainesville currently has single-family land use, which a city staffer argued that the board should work towards removing exclusionary zoning in order to provide more affordable and accessible housing. For now, the City Planning Board needs more time to consider all options before a vote. All those in favor of deferring to our next regularly scheduled meeting in April. 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 In April. Thank you. <laughs> um, say aye, please. Aye. Aye. Troy Myers, WUFT News. A little background on this issue. In October, the previous city commission voted to remove exclusionary voting. In January, the current city commission voted to have staff prepare an ordinance that would rescind efforts from last year's city commission to remove exclusionary zoning policies. The topic will be back up for discussion at the next regulatory scheduled meeting that is set to happen on April 27th. Governor Ron DeSantis launched his new book at an event in Venice, Florida this morning. DeSantis named the book The Courage to Be Free, Florida's Blueprint for an American Revival. The governor talked about how his bold leadership and referenced it as one of the main themes of his book. A nationwide tour is expected to accompany the book's release. Santa Sanibel Island passes another milestone in Hurricane Ian recovery. We will never ever surrender to the mob here in Florida. This is where woke goes to die. Thank you, guys. People were invited to the beach to see the lighthouse working again. Hurricane Ian caused some damage to the support structure. The lighthouse is 138 years old. This past weekend was really beautiful, and it looks like it'll be the same in the week ahead. WFT's Dara Getter joins us now with the weather forecast. Temperatures are feeling pretty warm outside with low 80s, 82 here in Gainesville, and low 80s around Alachua County. Outside on your campus cam, partly cloudy skies. It feels like 82, and we're feeling gust up to 23 miles per hour. Those southwesterly winds are going to continue having temperatures feeling nice and warm this evening. Upper 60s after nightfall and overnight tonight, mid 60s. We're also forecasting some fog tomorrow and I'll have more on exactly how far you can see ahead of you on your morning commute coming up. 
felines living in filth. That's what's prompting Alachua County to try and keep a local woman from ever owning animals again. Patricia Garbaldi is set to appear in court tomorrow after animal enforcement removed 15 cats from her home. WUFT's Megan Hartnett has been digging into this case and joins us now. Guys, I have been pouring through the 47 pages of Alachua County court documents and the details are disturbing. The living conditions were described as unsanitary and unsafe. The documents contain dozens of photos, images of the cats officers removed from Garibaldi's residence, 13 alive and two dead. The Alachua County Shelter's veterinarian examined the cats. Her report indicates many cats had severe flea infestations, multiple animals were missing teeth, and one was missing an eye. The vet also described the living environment and called the conditions deplorable. The photos tell the story. An excessive amount of trash, cat feces, and an infestation of bugs. Gainesville Fire Rescue tested and reported the ammonia levels from urine inside the house were so high that no one should be in the house for more than 16 hours. Officers also discovered a decomposing cat carcass in bins. Alice and Camila, the cats are currently in the county's custody. Thanks, Megan. As we mentioned, Garibaldi is scheduled to be in court tomorrow morning. We'll have a crew there and update this case tomorrow. Eastside res Gainesville residents clarify their needs and hopes for a future UF Health, the urgent care center. UF Health held a presentation last night to update its progress on designing the center. Residents took the opportunity to express their concerns from accessibility to a desire for primary care options. UF Health's Chief Diversity Officer said the honest feedback will strengthen the community partnership. The clinic is projected to open in May 2024. More than 1,000 University of Florida students contributed to the makeover of a local elementary school. Glen Springs Elementary School students came back to class this week with a colorful surprise. UF's nonprofit Project Makeover spent the weekend decorating the school by painting murals, benches, and signs. They also renovated the garden and outdoor play areas. Um, it's made a huge impact on our campus. Um, our staff has been super excited. It's been hard to keep it a secret. Um, but we're, we're really happy that it's, it's here and, and uh, it's going to impact our students for years to come. You know. Glen Springs Tiger Pride is now roaring with creativity and color. Parents were invited to visit today to admire the project and their children's art. Coming up on WFT's First Tip 5, students take to the U.S. Supreme Court in the fight to get their debt forgiven. You're watching WUFT-TV News. Today, the Supreme Court hears oral arguments in cases that challenge President Biden's plan to forgive up to $20,000 in student loan debt owed by tens of millions of Americans. Already 26 million people have applied for that relief, but have found themselves in legal limbo as a group of Republican states have led a challenge against the policy. NBC's Alex Barr has the latest from Washington. Passionate protest outside the Supreme Court today as justices hear arguments over whether the Biden administration can move forward with plans to forgive up to $20,000 in student loan debt for lower income borrowers. For us, this is the fight for our lives and this is the fight for our future. The administration says more than 40 million Americans are eligible for relief. 26 million have already applied. But six Republican-led states filed suit to block the program, arguing that federal agencies cannot put in place sweeping new policies with a significant economic impact without Congress signing off. Justices in the court's conservative majority zeroing in on that point. We take very seriously the idea of uh, separation of powers. Also questioning whether the policy is fair to other Americans. For example, people who've paid their loans. The Biden administration arguing the plan falls under a 2003 law that allows for student loan relief when there's a national emergency. The administration and advocates say the COVID pandemic applies. Everything else about COVID that s small businesses got, big businesses got, the states didn't sue. Why are they suing about individuals who really need it? 
Liberal-leaning justices today questioning whether the challengers have legal standing to sue. The people who are suing have to show they've been injured, and the six states really have not been injured here. Analysts say that is the administration's best hope for preserving the policy. A bill filed by the Florida Senate vows to cancel filings of political parties previously in support of slavery. Cited as the ultimate cancel act, the bill will eliminate registration and approve status of political parties who showed previous support of slavery or involuntary servitude. Any parties removed by the bill must immediately inform register, registered voters. Affected voters will now have no party affiliation reflected on their registration. Parties are allowed to register again under two conditions. They must re-register within six months of any election they wish to participate and substantially change their name. Severe weather is causing serious problems for millions right now, from the west through the east coast. NBC's Jay Gray has a closer look at these conditions and a forecast that includes the possibility for another round of storms by the end of the week. More than 60 million Americans facing winter weather advisories and warnings across the country. From blizzard conditions in the Sierra Nevadas to heavy snow, ice and strong winds across much of the Northeast. And we're expecting up to a foot of snow in parts of our state. As many as three dozen states dealing with dangerous road conditions. Power line just fell right in front of me. Thousands without power across the region. At least two tornadoes ripped across Illinois. <laughs> And in Ohio, a possible twister wrecking homes and snapping trees. Today. Right now, it's a total mess. And there's growing concern more severe weather could be on the way. Communities already dealing with difficult conditions now bracing for round two. Oh, yeah, I'm getting ready. You know, one stop at Home Depot, get some salt, um, stuff that I need. Forecasters warning an even larger system could sweep across the plains and Midwest, pushing into the northeast toward the end of the week. We've been seeing some really warm temperatures out lately. Yeah, it's finally starting to feel like spring. We've been seeing temps in the mid 80s and we're going to continue to feel that warmth throughout much of this week. I'll have more on what you can expect when we return. You're watching WUFT TV News. We have an area of high pressure sitting above the Atlantic and another area of high pressure north of this low pressure system you see here sustaining these dry conditions and keeping temperatures feeling really warm across the southeast. Temperatures nearing 90 here in Louisiana in the mid 80s in Georgia and the Panhandle. Outside on your campus cam, partly cloudy skies. It feels like 82 and we're feeling gust up to 23 miles per hour this evening. The sun is going to continue to remain and few clouds in the sky overnight tonight. Mild conditions with the mid 60s as your overnight low and on your morning commute, you'll be able to see under a quarter mile ahead of you. So some very dense fog, especially along this I-75 corridor across North Florida. Outside on your skies tomorrow, it looks like we're gonna be seeing partly cloudy skies and you'll be waking up to temperatures in the low 60s. We'll be reaching our daytime high in the mid 80s tomorrow. 86 here in Gainesville with temperatures in the low to mid 80s across much of our area. This weekend is when that front is going to arrive and you can see a line of showers following along with that low pressure system that's going to be developing later this week. This is Friday morning and those storms are going to reach the panhandle. It looks like as these storms reach our area, they're going to begin to break up but the storm still will be possible Friday night. This is Friday at 10 p.m. So storms are likely overnight on Friday. The rest of this week, we're going to continue feeling temperatures in the mid to upper 80s. But after that rain moves through this weekend, hopefully it'll cool us off into the upper 70s next week. Back to you. The Gator men's basketball team plays tonight. Yes, they get ready to take on an SEC rival. WUFT's Taylor Burr has more on the game after the break. You're watching WUFT-TV News. Welcome to sports, I'm Taylor Burr. 
The U.S. men's basketball team plays SEC rival Georgia tonight. The Gators look to get back to their winning ways after a tough loss to Vanderbilt over the weekend. Last month, UF beat the Bulldogs 82 to 75. However, this game is going to be very different. Florida continues to adjust their lineup after senior Colin Castleton got injured for the remainder of the season. UF will rely heavily on freshly Riley Kugel, who's coming off a career high of 24 against Kentucky and 20 against Vanderbilt. Game time is set for 7 in Athens. The UF women's basketball team, their regular season is already over. Now it's off to the SEC tournament. The Gators open up against Kentucky. UF currently sits 11th in the country while the Wildcats sit close behind at 14. Florida meets Kentucky for the second time this season after losing to them 81-75 last month. Leonie Correa put on a show against Missouri in the final game of the regular season, leading the Gators with 17 points and 16 rebounds. Game time is set for 1:15 tomorrow. The Florida baseball team has a busy couple of days. Tonight, UF will play at Jacksonville and then will turn around and play them again in Gainesville for a two-game series this weekend. Coming off a strong weekend and clenching a three-game series sweep against Cincinnati, the Gators look to keep their winning streak alive. UF will rely heavily on SEC co-player of the week, Jack Caglione. This season, the sophomore has a ridiculous 10 for 21 at the plate, has rocked six home runs, including a three-homer day against Cincinnati. UF currently has seven and one record to start the season, parked at sixth in the national D1 rankings. Game time is set for 6 p.m. The UF lacrosse team played Furman earlier today and the Gators dominated from start to finish. Florida beats Furman 20-9 with 13 different Gators scoring at least one goal. Danielle Pavarelli and Emma Lopinto were the dynamic duo. Both scored four goals combined with three assists. Meanwhile, All-American goalkeeper Sarah Resnick was fantastic again, only allowing four goals. Lastly, in high school basketball, only two teams remain in the boys' basketball state tournament. Williston plays Franklin County tomorrow at 6 p.m. The Red Devils have won 18 games this year and are currently on a six-game winning streak. Meanwhile, Hawthorne gets ready to take on Chipley tomorrow at 8. The Wildcats defeated Newberry by just two points to take home the victory at 43-41. Sophomore C.J. Ingram sunk two game-winning foul shots with just seconds remaining for Hawthorne to take home the victory. Both teams look to win their semifinal matchups tomorrow to meet in this year's Class 1A state championship. That's it for sports. Now back to you guys. A Rhode Island boy is about to donate his hair for the second time in his life. 12-year-old A.J. Silva first cut his hair four years ago and has decided to offer this opportunity to others. Silva has partnered up with Steph Salon so other people could donate their hair alongside his. So far, seven people have offered to alter their appearances. A.J. says growing his hair out is beyond worthwhile. What a great story. Before we go, one last check on the weather. If you're taking the kids to the bus stop tomorrow, you could run into some patchy fog. You'll be able to see under a quarter mile ahead of you, so some really dense fog, especially across this I-75 corridor here in north central Florida. The rest of this week, you're going to continue feeling temperatures nearing 90 degrees tomorrow and mid 80s on Thursday and Friday. But after that rain moves through over the weekend, it should cool us off into the upper 70s this weekend. Back to you. Thanks, Dara. BBC World News is next, and the PBS News Hour is coming up at 7. Well, your Florida news is always on at WUFT.org. Have a good night.